five eight zero alert, zero. Alert. There is another story about the nuclear manhole cover. Aria, I've told you, if there's no actual math, I don't care. Now, what was that last alert, number? Alert, alert, alert. Calculations or I'm not interested, Aria. Alert, alert, <sighs> alert. All right, that's it. There has been a glut of stories about the nuclear power manhole that made it to space over the years, and it's been done to death. But unfortunately, I don't think it's ever actually been done. So today, let's do the math ourselves and see if we can finally determine what happened to this nuclear-powered manhole. Did it actually become the first man-made object in space and the fastest man-made object ever? Alert, alert. I'm getting to it. Let's find out. Now entering the facility. In 1956, Robert Brownlee, a scientist working at Los Alamos, was trying to figure out how to contain an underground nuclear explosion. The first test, Pascal A, uh, didn't quite do that as a jet of fire was shot hundreds of feet into the sky up from a 150 meter deep borehole. Oopsie daisies. The second test, Pascal B, therefore, had a cast iron cap kind of like a manhole cover, welded to the top of it, even though Brownlee thought that wouldn't do anything. Uh, it didn't do anything. Upon detonation, the cap was shot up off the borehole like a hypersonic bullet from a gun and was captured in just a single frame of high-speed camera footage. Brownlee explained, it went like a bat, and later calculated that it was moving at maybe six times Earth's escape velocity. Acknowledged. Accelerating. What? No, no, wait, Aria, no, the, the cap, not me! Oh, I thought that acceleration was supposed to kill you in real life. Once the history of the Pascal B test hit the internet and the content mines, it exploded again, creating dozens of videos and stories all saying one thing or the other. Either the cap was going so fast it made it to space and therefore made history as the first man-made object in space and the fastest man-made object of all time, or it just vaporized itself in the atmosphere. That's what Robert Brownlee himself thought. My point here today is that most all of these stories don't say anything definitive because they don't attempt any calculations themselves. So let's attempt some calculations ourselves and determine finally what actually happened to that cap. No cap, for real, fam fam, gang gang, on God, actual Loki. Aria, can you take us in? I'm having a Loki stroke. I got you, fam. Oh, I'm gonna become a broccoli boy. To get to the bottom of this urban legend, we're gonna go even one step further than Brownlee did when he back of the envelope this thing all the way back in the 50s. To do so, we're gonna need a really good comparison. So what is leaving the atmosphere at a high velocity actually like? Well, the inverse, entering the atmosphere at a high velocity, right? So maybe let's try to find a paper on the thermodynamic consequences of atmospheric re-entry at hypersonic velocities. I don't know, something like that. Oh, hey, NASA has one of those. Let's use that. Alert. I'm getting to it, fat man. Just give me a second. Let's do this like proper pop scientists, okay? I'm not gonna just give you the final numbers like some channels that won't be named. I want you to actually understand what we're doing and why. Scrolling through the paper, we find this equation for the total heat input during atmospheric re-entry heating, which is again our analog, but in reverse. What does it say? It says that the total amount of heat energy, Q, is equal to the change in kinetic energy from re-entry velocity to final velocity, but only some fraction or multiple of this energy depending on drag and heating coefficients. Makes sense, right? Some amount of the energy of motion turns directly into heat depending on drag. A drag? Like how the internet is dead now? Exactly, Arya. I'm making sure you understand this equation conceptually because without that level of understanding, we're not gonna know whether the answer it gives us is right or wrong, whether the numbers make sense, and then we're not gonna learn anything. It's also the reason why I will take points off of your exam if you don't include your units. Oh, you're one of those professors, huh? Yeah, Aria, do you wanna be the guy that crashes a billion dollar robot into Mars? Didn't think so. 
This equation seems to be what we want. Now what? Well, if the cap made it to space, then it wasn't vaporized. So let's make this equation an inequality. Is the heat required to vaporize a manhole cover of known dimension and material less than the energy it would have received from atmospheric heating? If so, it would not make it to space. Let's build out the left side of the equation. The heat required to boil away some amount of iron is going to be the heat required to take the cap's mass from ambient temperature to iron's melting point, plus a little kick, plus the heat required to take the cap from its melting point to its boiling point, plus a little kick. The C's you see are the heating coefficients for iron in its various phases, and the H's are the enthalpies of fusion and vaporization, the extra energy you need to change phases. So this is our full expression. Now we just need some reasonable numbers for these variables. Should be easy, right? I just crashed another robot into Mars. It was meters, Aria, not feet. What did I say? Today's video is sponsored by New Scientist. Gamers, I'm award-winning science educator and lukewarm Hemsworth, Kyle Hill. You know, as trust in institutions fail, truth becomes subjective, and no one's doing the math on nuclear-powered manhole covers anymore, it's more important than ever to get your science and technology news from sources that you can actually trust. That's why I get a majority of my science and technology news from outlets like today's sponsor, New Scientist. New Scientist is a popular science magazine covering all aspects of science and technology. For almost 70 years, New Scientist has been offering balanced journalism that keeps you up to date on the latest in science. Like I try to do, the writers at New Scientist make complex scientific ideas and discoveries easy to understand and provide an evidence-based lens through which to explore different perspectives. Many of you have asked me about nuclear battery technology, and guess what? New Scientist is a perfect place to learn about it. This article in particular encouraged me to do a deep dive on so-called radiophotovoltaic micronuclear batteries. Kind of a mouthful, but very cool. Right now, new scientists are offering 10 weeks for $10. This is just $1 a week for full digital access on the New Scientist app and website. Science is constantly adding knowledge to its hallowed halls. Make sure you know all the new stuff. <laughs> new Scientist. Be one. Thanks to Brownlee himself, we already have almost all the numbers that we need. Upon detonation, he estimated that the cap was going six times Earth's escape velocity, which is 150,000 miles per hour. He also said the cap was a specific dimension, cast iron, four feet wide, four inches thick, which makes it with the density of iron around 2,000 pounds. We can then look up the heat transfer coefficients for iron in its various forms, the enthalpies of fusion and vaporization for iron, and the drag coefficient for a flat disk moving through the air. That's all but one number. Unfortunately, that's the hard number. The only thing we're missing is CH, a dimensionless heat transfer coefficient. It's a very complicated number because fluid dynamics is one of the hardest things in all of engineering and physics, but simply put, it's a semi-empirical or partially experimentally derived measure of how much convective heat transfer there is from a fluid at a surface compared to the total transfer. When we say convective heat transfer, think of what happens in your oven, how heat is transferred to your food via contact with moving air. This coefficient is going to be a very important number to know, because our fluid in this case is air moving past a nuclear-powered manhole cover at Mach Middle Finger. These Nusselt numbers are above my pay grade, I'll admit that, but I was able to find some numbers that I think do make sense. And it took you like two hours to do so. Oh hey Arya, how's your Mars robot doing by the way? And so, we are finally ready to chug this thing. Remember, the answer that we get should be in units of energy, joules, and if the right side is larger than the left side, then the atmospheric heating it experienced is enough to melt and vaporize and destroy the cap before it reaches outer space. So, Aria, plug them and chug them. According to our estimations, 
Yes, there was enough atmospheric heating to give enough energy to this cast iron cap to vaporize it as it moved through the atmosphere at hypersonic velocities a few times over. No, it did not make it to space. It was not the fastest man-made object at the time, probably. But like we said, does this conceptually make sense? This is our sanity check. Numbers don't mean much if we don't understand them. The equation doesn't care what it gives us. Equations are like raccoons, garbage in, garbage out. So is this number reasonable? Is it a reasonable conclusion to say that a very unaerodynamic hunk of iron burned itself up in our atmosphere? Well, what else have we observed? Well, we've observed meteors traveling three times slower than this with a similar mass spectacularly destroying themselves in our atmosphere. So I think that given observations and our numbers, yes, our conclusion is reasonable and we can finally put this to rest. Or in Gen Z terms, we ain't bugging after plugging and chugging. Until next time. Alert, alert, alert. Nope. Ban the channel, no math. Not interested. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. If you want to drape on a silky white lab coat, if you want to look like a nice, firm cooling tower, if you want to join our private Discord, get private members only live streams with me, go to the link you see on Aria right now and join the facility today. And hey, if you support us just enough, you get your name in every single video. Lucky you. There's hundreds and hundreds of you who have already taken advantage of this immense gift I am giving you. And there's so many, how am I even gonna pass that? I was not expecting the calculation to come so close. So to be within an order of magnitude of maybe not vaporizing was probably a little close for comfort for a back of the envelope kind of calculation for me. And it does make sense why it would be that close. A, 2,000 pound hunk of cast iron would take a lot of energy to bring it from room temperature to literally gas. So it doesn't, it doesn't really surprise me that it took that much energy to boil away this cap, but it was surprising that it was close to the atmospheric heating energy. And yeah, sometimes the math do be like that, but you only find out once you actually do the math. Yeah. But Kyle, they don't always know how to do the math. Well, then don't say one way or another what happened. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, and I should say before we go that it's, even if it wasn't totally vaporized according to our math, it's not actually that close because it definitely deformed and destroyed, like we said, itself. Thanks for watching. <laughs>